Hey guys, if you want to scoot up, there's a lot of console output you probably won't be able to see from the back. Uh, save you the eye strain, or you can look at the slides later, or if you don't care to see the console output, but there'll be a lot of console output uh, you probably can't see from way back in the back. Eric, Eric, especially if you're short like Eric, you probably want to scoot up. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for coming out and listening to me talk. Um, I've given this talk kind of once before at ETSU. I don't know if any of you guys are from ETSU. If you are and you've heard this talk before, you might want to go to the other one because you probably <laughs> heard this talk. If not, i got lots of great stuff for you in store. Uh, let me go over a little bit about myself. That's me. That's my pretty picture, my glamour shot. Um, security analyst at Sword and Shield. I'm also a member of the Tennessee Air National Guard. I'm working on my master's degree through SANS. Um, got two kids, just one wife right now. <laughs> if you want to get a hold of me, uh, that's my personal email and my Twitter handle. Um, I don't really don't use Twitter too often, but feel free to email me about anything that you ever want to talk about. I'd be glad to answer and respond. Pretty open guy. Uh, I like to I like to give a little disclaimer before I get started. Um, no matter how smart I think I am, I don't actually know everything. So if you find a technical inaccuracy with what I have to say or what I've said or just let me know, we can talk about it, but uh, please don't expect me to be perfect. I wouldn't expect that of you, but I'm just letting you know. Uh, I could have got something wrong. Here's a brief outline of the things we're going to talk about today. We're going to go over a little bit of PowerShell, give you a little background information, and then I'm going to talk a lot about attack tools. It's probably pretty heavy on the attack tools because that's what I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, then I'm going to move into a little bit about malware, a little bit about forensics tools, and then I'm going to close up with ways you can kind of block these attacks or find ways to defend them. Here's the definition of PowerShell. I pulled it off of a website. Um, also, real quick, my slides will be available on Sword and Shield's blog afterwards. Um, and my slides have tons of notes and reference links where you can get all this content from. So if I, I go through this stuff quickly, you don't get the chance to write it down or take pictures. Uh, it'll all be available later on. Maybe this is the definition of PowerShell. Do we have any uh, programmers in here have ever programmed anything in a bash or in wrote in a batch script? Batch script? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me give out some candy to those who have written batch scripts because <laughs> here you go, sir. Oh. Anyone else? Here you go, sir. Put you back there. Well, anyways, if you've written anything in a bash script before, you know how awful it is, especially with today's modern programming languages. PowerShell is beautiful uh, for many reasons. Uh, these are the reasons why PowerShell is beautiful. It's, you know, it's Microsoft's new, updated, you know, old DOS prompt. It can do a lot of things. It's primarily built on the .NET framework. Uh, you use it to interact with the Windows API. Everything works off of verb noun completion. So, like, if you want to do something like get help, you just type the words get dash help, you know, the verb and the noun, what it is that you want to do. It has tab completion. That's always great, especially if you're coming from Linux or anything like that that has it and it's stuff in your path. You can alias any command you want. How many of you have ever been in a Linux command prompt and typed ls? Oh, yeah. With PowerShell, guess what? It works. It'll give, because they alias the command over. So you can straight up hit ls and PowerShell and it will give you a listing of what you want. So you can alias any command that you want to. But the most, uh, one of the good things about PowerShell is that everything comes out in objects. If you've done any object-oriented programming of any sort, PowerShell works in objects. So you can literally craft up your own object or you can use the built-in objects that they have and you can do smart things with the data when you get an object back as opposed to the old command shell where you just get text strings on your, on your, on your monitor and that's all you get. Uh, PowerShell has actual structures. You can build your own or use ones they got. Uh, syntax highlighting is available in version 5. It looks like that with the yellow, and then you'll see lots of slides later with green and gray and all kinds of other stuff about it. PowerShell's been around for a long time. It came default on Vista. Probably, people probably don't know that was there. And you could install it on XP if you'd wanted to, but please don't use XP. <laughs> um, but it's been around. I think it's coming up on its 10-year anniversary here soon on how long PowerShell's been around. Um, and like I said, version 5 is the newest release. Version 5 came on Windows 10, and you can upgrade your pack pass the versions up to version 5 now. A uh, PowerShell script ends in .ps1. Those things are not clickable. You can't double click and run a PowerShell script like you can a shell script or something like that. You actually have to run it from the command prompt. Microsoft intentionally did that where you can't double click and run a script. And then you can set up a module, to like a lack of better terms, it's like a function or a class. You can put all your other stuff in there and use a PowerShell module. A PowerShell also comes with the integrated scripting environment. So you, know, you can open up the IDE as you will. 
to mess with your PowerShell programs. And one of the other cool things is you can straight up compile a PowerShell script to EXE if you wanted to uh, and distribute it out that way if you don't want people to see your source code. Here's an example of the, again, the verb noun. Here's a get help. I got help on the command get alias, and this is what it looks like. Uh, with these things, they're called commandlets, and so get help is a commandlet. Um, there's tons of information. Most people that write scripts, they all document really well. So gone are the days where you don't have to, you can't figure out what's going on, how you run a tool. The most PowerShell commandlets are pretty good with that. Let's see, you can pipe the data structures around. That's what I was doing here. I did a, a git process, which got me a list of all the processes. Uh, and then I piped it to a command that called get member. Get member is really nice because if you ever have an object and you're like, great, I got an object, now what am I going to do with this thing? Well, get member tells you that this object has methods and properties and aliases and events and all kinds of stuff. So you can figure out how it is you're going to use this object for what it is you're going to do with it. And I just limited it to 10, 10 items. Um, some of the good use cases for PowerShell, um, again, obviously, like I said earlier, it's, it's uh, integrated in Windows. It's, uh, everyone's using it for everything. In fact, if you get Server 2016 Nano, I believe it is, it has no GUI. You just have to interact with uh, PowerShell only. That is one of the ways to do it. And you do that through PS remoting, which is like SSH, for lack of better terms, but it's the way Microsoft does their own stuff. Um, and you can, with PS remoting, you can run one command across your whole network from one workstation. Um, but if that wasn't good enough for you, Microsoft's participating in the OpenSSH project, and they, they said they're going to have OpenSSH integration here soon. Um, and then uh, antivirus uses it. Uh, actually, malware writers use it. Red team people use it. Um, and one of the better things about it, it has in-memory code execution, which I'll touch on here in a minute. <coughs> Here's an example of PS remoting. Like I said, I got a lot of screenshots. Uh, I had a, a laptop. Uh, that I was going to use, and I was going to show you guys some stuff on the VMs, except for my laptop's like 20 years old and only has VG output, and my boss won't buy me a new one. So I had to use, I had to use their slide deck. <laughs> Anyways, here's an example of PS remoting to another computer. It's like using SSH. I was I just connected to another computer over there. And you can see once you uh, remote over to another computer, it puts out the host name up there so you know which computer it is you're connected to. Um, there's four ways to load scripts or to use the scripts in PowerShell. The top one, actually, sorry, there's three ways. The top one's the execution policy. Any of you guys heard of the PowerShell execution policy? Not too many of you. People think that it's a security boundary because if it's set to uh, signed only, then they think that you can't run their PowerShell scripts. So you try and run one the very first time on your computer and will say that you can't run it because you're not authorized. So you change the execution policy to unrestricted or signed or whatever. But uh, that can be changed by anybody. If that wasn't good enough for you, you can just tell it, hey, let's bypass the security policy for now, and PowerShell will let you do that. You can just continue on. Um, but one of the ways is you can import a module with the import module command. There's an example of me import a module. Or you can use dot sourcing, which is just a dot, and then the path to the actual PowerShell script, and it will pull it all into memory in that, in that session that you have there. There's one other way, <coughs> a real popular way amongst attackers. Anybody happen to know what the other way is? <coughs> no? Well, I'm glad you don't know, because I'm going to show you. Uh, it's the IEX download cradle. This thing's very important for you to pay attention to. I'll, you'll see this used over and over and over and over and over and over everywhere in all my slides. Uh, IEX is a short alias for invoke expression. Uh, and what this does is it creates uh, a web object and then it downloads your PowerShell script from wherever. You can download it from the internet, you can download it from another machine, you can download it from SMB. You can, you, and then it pulls it all into memory. So like this PowerShell script right here and any malicious, malicious ones that I have, they never touch the disk. I, from a PowerShell session, I'll go out to the internet, I'll grab the script that I want, pull it into memory forensically. There's nothing on the computer for you to know that um, there'll be nothing for you to know that I pulled that script in there. <clears throat> and here's an example of me pulling a script down and then executing the details on there. Here's some of the tools that I'm going to go over. Uh, the list was quite longer, and as I started building my presentation, I didn't have enough time to get it all in there. Plus, you probably don't want to sit here for three hours, so I took some of the tools off. But these are the kind of the attack tools that I'm going to go over. How many of you guys have heard of uh, Mimikatz? Mimikatz is a really great tool. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more about that later. This one right here is called Power Memory. Um, of you that are familiar with Mimikatz, does anybody know what version of Windows it won't work in by default? 
No? No? Well, Microsoft put some protections in place in uh, Server 2012 and Windows 10 and 8.1 that keep Mimi Cats from running. Uh, you can make a registry change and, and reboot the machine. But anyways, this program right here, Power Memory, it does a lot of things. Um, but the primary use case for it is for getting a dump of LSAS, uh, which stores those credentials in it. And it'll work on all the way up to Windows 10. It doesn't care what your operating system is. It, will grab, it can grab the clear text credentials out of memory from any computer. Uh, one of the ways it does is it uses Windows signed binaries. So there's, again, no, no other tools on the disk that are kind of weird. You just use straight up Microsoft tools, and, and you grab a copy of the memory. Here's an example of it over here. This is the main screen of when you run the tool up. And then this one over to the right over here was me uh, extracting uh, the memory from my, my own computer. It was a Windows 10 computer, just kind of the steps that it went through. Uh, that, notice down towards the bottom, ask if I want to exfiltrate data. You can have it send your stuff to Pastebin if you want. So that way, you can have it set on a private repo so that way it's not open to the public, but it'll just exfiltrate it straight out for you. And there's an example. There's my password. Don't, don't use it, please. It's <laughs> super strong. Um, <laughs> but this, again, was on a Windows 10 computer, and this is what it looks like. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier, all the tools that I'm talking about, uh, the light gray text underneath the tool name has the tool author. Uh, the Twitter handle if I knew it, and a place where you can get the tool if you wanted to use it, trying to give attribution where it's due to all the people that wrote these tools. Uh, another set of tools is called uh, PowerShell AD Recon. Shen, Sean Metcalf, he's really big in the PowerShell space. He actually gave a talk uh, very similar to this one recently, but he develops a lot of tools as well. But this tool set is used for interacting with Active Directory, like the title says, and, and gathering information. And some of the other some of the scripts of Note are the Discover Interesting Services and Exchange Server and the SQL Server. Uh, of you that work with Active Directory, are you familiar with SPN, the service principle name? You can ask a domain controller for its available services without actually running an NMAP scan on the network. You just tell the domain controller, hey, tell me where all your SQL servers are, and it will answer you back with that. You don't have to do any NMAP scan or whatever. So these tools are good for that. Here's an example up top here. Uh, in my lab network, Matt was over talking about Skynet taking over. I'm on, I'm on my way to make that happen. I got Skynet set up at work. <laughs> but this one up here, uh, again, I asked the domain controller with this tool, tell me where the SQL servers are. And this one down here in the bottom right-hand corner, I said, tell me where the service accounts are. The service accounts are a special note because typically on a network, people will set their user accounts to change their passwords regularly, but they won't change their service accounts. Um, and then through another attack that I don't really go into detail here, I can grab um, a Kerberos ticket from all the service accounts and then just go to town cracking them. And if it takes me two months, that's cool because your password's still going to be the same however long it takes me to crack it. But I can use Kerberos to grab a ticket and then crack the password of the service account. It will take longer um, and then use it later. So that, that's why that one's interesting, finding all the service accounts on the network so I know what to target next. Um, if you ever made your way to another computer and you needed some tools that weren't there, again, you can use FTP. Um, without having to download a client, you can just use this PowerShell FTP script. Here's an example up here of me setting up the connection and then I just made the connection over. You know, these things come in handy if you're trying to exfiltrate data and um, get things off the network or from another, another computer. The DS uh, internal power, PowerShell module, those things are great as well. Um, this guy has written a ton of functionality in his tool set. Um, PowerShell version 5 also comes with the way you guys are familiar with the apt packet manager or the yum packet manager in Linux. Uh, Windows PowerShell version 5 has something very similar. One option is called NuGet, and I can't remember what the other one's called, but you can straight up say import uh, DS internals module. I can't remember the actual command. Uh, but you can, it'll go out to the repository and get it from the command line just kind of like app does. It doesn't actually, you don't have to download and install any of that kind of stuff. That's a PowerShell version 5. But anyways, these are some of the scripts that he has, the functionality in there. And again, I'm going to go over a couple screenshots on them. But notice up on the upper right-hand corner, it talks about converting hashes. If you need to know a, if you know a password and you want to try and pass the hash across the network, you can go give it you know, the clear text password and then create the hash so that you can pass it around. Uh, but one of my favorites, I love the ntds.dit file. I'm not sure if you guys are able to talk about it. Uh, 
actually David, you talked about it earlier in your home lab about how you exfiltrated it with, with crack map. Uh, here is another way to do it with a PowerShell only tool. Um, first you gotta get a copy of the sys key um, and then you add that to an object in PowerShell. And then you come down here and you just use this tool from the DS internal suite and it will extract all the, all the stuff out of the ntds.dip file. It actually gives you back um, an object that contains all the information about the user. I didn't show it here because it's really long because there's a lot of information associated with the user. But some of those things of note or comments that are typed in about the user or let's say their past 10 password hashes are in there. So again, you get back an object out of PowerShell that you can do something with. You can automate and script and do lots of things with that after that. This one down here also, um, after I pulled everything out of the dit file with this module, it'll, it has a nice other script where it'll give it out to you in Hashcat format so you can send it straight to your cracker without, it has one for John, John the Ripper as well. So that always comes in handy. You don't have to like, right now if you use any of the other tools, you have to kind of format your text file for whichever password cracker you're gonna use, but this one has it built right into it. Just pipe the object to it and it'll spit it out in the format you need it. Another great tool um, is called Dark Observer. It has a ton of functionality. I'm not gonna go over all of it. You can see, I tried to list it all here so you can see, but it's great for basically once you get on a box in a network, you can just start enumerating stuff about the network. You wanna find sensitive files, so there you go. Um, network shares, you can do a ping sweep. Looks like it'll do virus total hash analysis. The nice thing about this is someone wrote an all PowerShell functionality. Um, how to do all these things. So you don't need to again put custom binaries. PowerShell is technically a script language. So again, you just pull these scripts down that do all kinds of stuff for you. And I'm just showing you the functionality you get with it. With it. And then when you get access to a remote machine, for me, because I'm an attacker, um, my tools aren't necessarily on the computer that I compromise. And historically, you'll, you, you might upload your own binaries. And when you do, they'll get flagged by AV and then you'll lose. Uh, but this method, you don't, you don't have to worry about that connect your computer, use PowerShell, then download my tool in memory and you, the computer's not on the wires without my tool, so that's there doing its thing. Um, any of you guys out here use OWA or familiar with OWA? OWA is great for us when we're doing external assessments because it provides an interface to one act, or interact with Active Directory because they're typically using Active Directory creds and it's a good way to do password spraying. Anybody know what password spraying is? <clears throat> brute forcing is where you do one user account with multiple passwords over and over. Password spraying is the inverse of I know all the user accounts and I just try one password across all of them. So if I use something like the Harvester or anything else to scrape your organization's email accounts, I now have a full list of usernames and I can take that set of usernames. <clears throat> I can use something like this OWA toolkit and I can launch a brute force attack against all the usernames. <laughs> with one password. A good one right now would be something like summer 2016. That's guaranteed to get me at least one hit. And that's frankly all we need is just one connection after that. Um, and if that wasn't good enough for you, you can also, again, this is all from external from the internet. This doesn't require you to be local on the network, but this tool, I can use it to download a copy of your address book, the gal, the global address list uh, off your email server. But once I have valid creds, I have to have valid creds first, but this is a good tool for that. Here's some of the other modules that it has in there. You can. You can use this PowerShell script to just straight up write a message. You can see that last um, command down at the bottom. I can write email from PowerShell and just turn around and send it out after that. Anybody know what the Swiss Army knife of network security is? Netcat, yeah. Well, someone put it in PowerShell, which is great. Again, Netcat's a binary. I'm gonna have to put it on your box. Um, this isn't a binary, I don't have to. Again, here's the IEX download string I was talking about earlier. Get connect to your computer. I don't have my tool set there, so what do I do? I just download it from the internet. This one, I actually had it on the local computer, but you can give it wherever it's at, download it, it's in memory, then you can use it. So what I did here was set up a bind shell listening, uh, and it was gonna give back PowerShell afterwards. Uh, and there's an example connecting with the netcat on my attacker machine over to that bind shell. And as you notice, I got a PowerShell terminal right off the bat. So that's always nice as well. <coughs> and you guys hear my talk last year on WPAD or NetBIOS spoofing? Honestly, that's my favorite way to attack a network. I used to roll into a network and do a vulnerability assessment first. Now I don't. I just go in and start spoofing names and collecting hashes right off the bat. I don't even waste my time trying to find other vulnerabilities. 
But I use a tool called Python Responder, uh, which David also talked about in his talk. Uh, it's a great tool. I love using it. Um, this is that, like Python Responder, but this is written in PowerShell. It's called Inve, and it does the same thing. It listens on the network for NetBIOS traffic or link local multicast name resolution traffic, and it spoofs to it, and then people will send back their hashes, um, and then you can start trying to crack the password hashes from there. Again, this is great, especially if you're trying to pivot, compromise a machine in the DMZ. I don't want to upload my own tools. I can't run Python Responder on that domain controller that I just got to. So instead, I will just upload this with the IEX download cradle into memory, and I will run my own NetBIOS spoofer straight from that computer instead. Down here is an example of me capturing two uh, HTTP and TLM uh, hashes coming back. I'd have to crack them, but trust me, they typically always get at least one password. Again, we only need one to kind of go on. All right, power tools. This is, this is one of my favorite. I got a secret man crush on uh, Will Schroeder. He wrote a lot of the tools that I talk about. Um, he's one of my favorite guys when it comes to PowerShell, especially offensive tool, tools. Power Tools has all of these tools in it. I personally have not used the Pew 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 or the Power Breach. I have used Power Pick. Power Pick is, um, I think it's C Sharp, but it might be, let's see if it says on there. No, it, it's either C Sharp or C++, but it's a way to execute PowerShell uh, in a compiled language like C Sharp, and it doesn't, it's not, it's not a tool you can actually download or run. You'll have to download it into Visual Studio and use it to compile your code and all kind of stuff, but it's a way to run PowerShell commands from uh, executable. Um, power up. Um, again, Andrew Smith, my coworker, he's going to talk on purge escalation across the way. Power up does that. It's a one PowerShell script. Again, I use the IX download cradle on a compromised compromise machine. Pull it down. It does all the privilege escalation checks for you. It checks for unquoted service paths and places that you can write to and services you can change. And it gives you a nice little report when you're done. So gone are the days where I have to manually go through and do a process list and see where all the service paths are and see if I can change any of them. Just run this power up script and it will tell me my methods for being able to uh, privilege, uh, to up my, up my privileges. And to top that off, it'll tell you where it's done and then you can just run another command let it actually do it for you. So it'll say this uh, service has an unquoted service path and if you run this command, it will go ahead and replace that command with your own service path and your binary and you're good to go. But my all time favorite is PowerView. If I've ever worked with any of you before, you'll hear me talk about PowerView. PowerView, PowerView is a beautiful tool and I'm about to show you why. This can actually be used by blue teamers on a network. I think there's a practical application for that as well, but I typically use it as a red teamer. So the kind of the layout that I did here was the, the, bolder, the bold text is like the category, and then below are some of the functions in that category. The number indicates the total number of modules. I didn't want to list them all out here. I just want to kind of highlight some of the better ones. Uh, I'll get into some screenshots here that actually show them in use, but as you can see, there's a ton of functionality going on in here. One of my particular favorite ones is user hunting, which I'll get into in a second. All right, here's an example of PowerView. PowerView does require me to have one set of valid user domains. So typically when I start an engagement, I connect my computer to your network, and I have no, I'm not a domain joined machine, I don't have any domain user accounts, I don't have nothing like that. So then I'll do something like the WPAD or the Inve, uh, do some broadcast spoofing, get some hashes back, crack one. And then all these commands that you'll see run in PowerView can be any normal user. They don't have to be an admin user, none of the such. Just a normal user account works to do everything. And essentially what it's doing in the background is it's asking uh, Active Directory a ton of questions and it, and it puts it into PowerShell objects that you can do stuff with. So for this one, I wanted to know the domain SID, which is probably pretty boring. But if you ever wanted to brute force the domain admin account and they happen to have changed the username from administrator to something else, this is how you can find out what it is. Um, the administrator account on every computer ends with a RID, a relative identifier, and it's a number. Does anybody know what that number is that all administrators end in? 500, that's right. So I got the domain SID, I put dash 500 on it, and I found out, well, on this domain, the, the domain administrator's name is super admin, not admin. So that was handy for me to use a power view again from a normal user. Over here, I wanted to find out stuff about users, so I just sent a query over and it told me all of this stuff. Uh, what's interesting here is, you notice I asked for the description field that's an active directory. If 
you look down here, there's a bunch of passwords. Some smart guy put all the passwords in the description comments in Active Directory. Um, you'd laugh and say nobody would ever do that, but they do. I mean, I did this for my lab environment, but you, you'll be surprised what you can find scraping the comment sections of Active Directory user objects to see what kind of information you can get back. If you don't get passwords, you can get tons of other useful information at the very least. Again, here's a, just a, a user object back of the super admin. You can see there's tons and tons of stuff on there about it. Uh, for this particular engagement, I wanted to know where the enterprise admins are, you know, domain admin, enterprise admin, that's the place I want to be. So I was like, I don't know who, who's in the enterprise admin. So again, I used PowerView from a non-domain computer with a normal user account um, to find out who the enterprise admins were. That's who they were. Uh, you can get some stuff uh, about the GPOs or the domain policies. The top tells me the password policy. It allows me to do smart brute forcing. If I know your password policy is seven characters and the complexity is turned off, then I won't waste my time trying complex passwords. I'll probably try the password password and it'll probably work. <coughs> Down here I get GPO information. Sometimes people save passwords and GPOs. That's a nice place to look. Well, the way the GPOs used to work, Microsoft has fixed it now where you can't do it, but you used to be able to push a GPO that would set a local admin password and it was, I want to say encrypted, I don't think it was encoded, I'm pretty sure it was encrypted, but then the key got put out for it so that way anybody can decrypt the user, the password from a GPO. Wow. Uh, anyways, so I found out who the enterprise admins were and I want to know where they're logged in at. So then I use this uh, part of PowerView called Invoke User Hunter. And it will, if you don't feed it any flags, it will automatically tell you where all the domain admins are logged in. I want to know which computers the domain admins are logged into, so that way I can try and break into that computer, because that's where I want to be, wherever the domain admins are. But if that doesn't work, if you've got a buddy who's on the network somewhere and you want to know where he's logged in at and his IP address, run this invoke user hunter, give it the username flag, and it will tell you where they're logged in at. Uh, onto the next toolkit, this one's called PowerSploit. Again, same, same thing with the module category and some modules that are in it. Um, it does a lot of neat stuff in here. Uh, it's more of an attack tool. You can do lots of cool things with that. Uh, this tool, PowerSploit, actually holds what's called an Evoke Mimikatz. It is a PowerShell implementation of Mimikatz, so that way I can, again, um, run Mimikatz on your computer without downloading any binaries onto your box. I can just download into memory with the IEX Cradle. Uh, the power tools that I talked about before, the power view and power up, they're now part of the power exploit project, but I started using them before they kind of merged and I still think of them as separate and I want to talk about them separate because I like power view a lot, but they're now actually part of this project. Um, I typically do a demo, but this is an example of me creating shell code. I just used MSF Venom and I created myself a Windows payload that executed to open the calculator. It's just cool thing that you do. Thing to note here is that's the shell code. Um, then I got, I got the name of a process. I was looking for a process to inject my shell code into, so I just asked for use um, PowerShell, got the name of the Explorer process. And using the invoke uh, shell code, which is part of PowerSploit, I gave it, um, I basically got the process that I wanted to inject into, and then all the shell code that I wanted to inject into, and then using PowerSploit, I just injected my shell code straight into another process on a box. Again, all in memory. All done through PowerShell, no binaries, touching the disk, nothing of the such. <coughs> What's that? Do you wish to cure out your evil plans? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it does sound here. Do you wish to carry out your evil plans, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I didn't mention this earlier. PowerShell can take encoded and compressed commands. So if you wanted to encode, um, what you're going to execute in PowerShell for a little bit of obfuscation. You can take this thing up here. I got the IEX download cradle, uh, and then I just use this PowerSploit module to encode it. All this stuff you see here should be a bunch of base 64 of the encoded command that I want to run. And you can quite literally, down at the bottom, you see right here, I ran PowerShell dash E for encoded command, and then my base 64 string, and it executes the command afterward. And it's great for obfuscation, so you don't know what I'm doing on your computer. You just, if you ever see me run that, for some reason you happen to see it, you would just see a bunch of base64 string. Uh, here's an example of a key logger from that module. 
See, you can use PowerSploit to do port scans. Again, I connect to a computer. I don't have any of my tools there. I can't exactly install Nmap on your computer, but I can uh, download this PowerSploit module into memory uh, and then do a port scan on your network from there using PowerShell only. And again, what's nice about it is it gives you back data objects. So what you see down here at the bottom part is a data object with, with certain things about it. Um, and I, what I did over towards the end where it says where object alive equals true, I basically said only give me back the objects where the host was alive. I don't want the other objects back. But again, you can programmatically handle this data when you do a port scan and do lots of things with it because you have back actual data objects you can do something with. Here's Invoke Mimi Cats I was talking about. If you guys haven't seen it before, it's great. It grabs clear text passwords out of memory no matter how strong they are. They can be a 30 character password. It'll grab it straight out of memory. Um, here's an example of that running. Uh, I used a short URL because if you type the full path, but um, the Invoke Mimi Cat script is available on GitHub public, so you can just pull it from there every time you want to use it. You don't have to host it yourself anywhere. Just pull it straight from their GitHub repo every time and then run it on the computer. Last year I gave a, in my WPAD talk, I talked about it quickly, I just thought I'd note it again. Uh, using that PowerShell functionality, uh, I was able to do a big old um, PS exec loop in PowerShell and I just basically sprayed the whole network with this loop and then down, so I connected to every computer on the domain. Uh, I ran a PowerShell command that downloaded Mimikatz into memory, ex, uh, got the password out and sent it to my SMB server and I did that on like 200 computers on a network all using PowerShell. Uh, and both Mimi Cats never touched the disk on a computer, so forensically you don't know that I ran Mimi Cats on your computer. Just take this example of that running. I wrote a parser to handle 200 output. Uh, there's an example of it running. Uh, Nysheng is another, another great tool set. I don't spend much time working with this one, not for any particular reason, and, and I find the tool sets I need and all other things, but uh, Nickel Middle, I think that's how you say his name, he provides a lot of training on PowerShell too. He's really prominent in the PowerShell space on his tool development. Same thing with the functionality, group, and some tools going on down here. You can do lots of neat things. So there's some more modules on it. Uh, one of the nice things down here, you got this one, um, Invoke Mimikatz WDS Digrade. Earlier I told you that on Windows 8.1 and up and Windows Server 2012, you can't grab credentials out of memory. You got to do what's called a W Digest downgrade, where you go set a registry setting to tell Windows to keep storing the password in memory. It's built into this tool. You can just run it, and it'll do it for you. <coughs> the show target screen is nice. This guy wrote a PowerShell script that will stream somebody's desktop over with MPEG across the network. So, you know, screenshots are cool, but I can stream your whole desktop like a movie using this thing. I can just sit there and watch you the whole time, as opposed to just taking screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. I can just stream it over the network. And he, he's written a blog post on how to do it. So again, that's in my, in my slides. Here's an example of me running one of his scripts. Windows is very nice and it will store your password for all the Wi-Fi networks that you've ever connected to. I don't know how many of you had your laptop for a couple years. Um, but you can run this script on your victim and you can get all the Wi-Fi passwords for all the networks they ever connect to. Here's an example of me getting out the password to my iPhone. Wi-Fi network, so when I tether my laptop to my thing, I ran this script on my Windows computer, pulled out the Wi-Fi password. That's great, especially if I catch you at Starbucks and compromise your machine, and I would like your corporate machine or your corporate network's Wi-Fi password, I can grab all that information from one place. PowerShell Suite, yeah, another set of tools. Um, the two main ones I'll talk about here are Invoke Run As and Subvert PE. Um, earlier I talked about how I just need one set of valid user credentials even though I'm not uh, part of the domain join machine. I use a program called Run As to do that. It allows me to impersonate a network user. I give it the username, <coughs> password, and whenever I run a command it runs it as that user just like the thing is called. Um, but if you ever find your place in a company where they were trying to up the security and removed Run As.exe from a computer, that's all right. Somebody wrote it in PowerShell. You can just use this PowerShell Run As to do all in PowerShell. Or if you'd like to run all your tools from PowerShell without using the binary at all, just pull this thing down. Here's an example of me doing it. Uh, again, using the IEX download cradle that I talk about over and over and over. What's interesting, this time I used SMB connection. I'm pretty sure it will take any URI. I haven't only tried HTTP and SMB. I haven't tried any other URI, but so you don't even have to connect over HTTP. If for some reason they have a web proxy, but they let 4.4 out over, 4.4.5 out over the network, you can just make an SMB connection instead. You don't need to make HTTP. And it's an example of me spawning a new shell as a different user. 
Uh, Subvert PE is really nice. There's this thing called code caves. When someone compiles a program, there's empty space in there for various reasons. Subvert, VE, uh, Subvert PE will go through, find a nice place, and it'll put your shell code right in that, in that program, and that program will continue to run after the fact. So you can basically backdoor whatever executables that you want to, and you can use this PowerShell script to do it. <coughs> so I told Subvert PE the path. I wanted to backdoor the notepad dot, uh, notepad plus plus dot exe. Uh, and then, so I told it where the XE was and it found a code cave and it put, put my shell code in there. It actually, it's a default with its own, it just opens calculator, but you can go in and change the shell code to whatever you want it to actually be. I, I didn't have a screenshot of it, um, but basically once, after you run this and you double click on notepad EXE, it'll spawn whatever program you told it to. In this case, it would open up a calc on top of that. Um, but if, if you don't have PowerShell.exe on your computer, um, or you happen to have been an administrator, you block the use of PowerShell.exe, that's no problem. There's plenty of tools around that. Um, any of you guys been on a network that blocks CMD.exe before? No, I have. I've been on some where they won't allow you to run CMD.exe, but you can run PowerShell.exe. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. PowerShell, you can do lots more stuff with. But um, if, if they have application whitelisting and that you can't use PowerShell.exe at all, that's no problem. Uh, this guy right here, Jared Height, he wrote a tool called PS Attack. Not only does it run PowerShell commands without PowerShell.exe, this guy has taken all the tools that I previously talked to you about and he crammed them into this compiled binary. To make it even better than that, he's encrypted all the modules when it's stored on disk, when it's saved there, and when you double click the program and run it, he loads those encrypted modules into memory and then decrypts them. That makes it really hard for antivirus to tell what's going on. Because although if it was going to flag on some PowerShell module based off the text of it, it's not going to know because by the time it gets decrypted, it's already in memory. So there's, there's some of the tool lists that he has over there, PowerSploit, PowerTools, Nyshang, PowerCat, Invade, just like all the tools I was just telling you about. He has them all compiled into this one binary. You just run on your computer uh, and you're good to go. And it does, a ton, it does tons of other stuff on top of that. Um, if that wasn't good enough for you, a guy named Ben Ten, he's also very prominent in the PowerShell space, he wrote a tool called Not PowerShell. It's, it's just the EXE, um, and it runs PowerShell commands for you. Um, the one thing to know about PowerShell earlier, when we first started talking, I was talking about how it, it works with .NET. PowerShell is really just an interface that deals with the common language interface that .NET uses. Um, so if you take away PowerShell.exe, that's no problem. Somebody will just write their own tool that talks straight to that common language interface. Uh, and this is another tool that does that. Here's an example of me just um, using, again, the IEX download cradle without PowerShell, um, downloading PowerView, and then finding out where the domain controller was. That was what I used that for. I'm going to have to step it up here. I'm going to run a little behind. Uh, remote access uh, uh, tools. Here's one called PoshRat by Casey Smith. Uh, these are some of the functionalities, but you can basically use it to set up a web server, and then you can use it to connect web shells back and forth. I don't use it too often, um, but again, you just use the IX download cradle to get yourself remote access to a computer. Metasploit has a ton of functionality for PowerShell. These are some of the modules that are listed in there. I know it's a lot. I'm just going to move on to the next actual where I show you some images. Uh, you can set up a reverse PowerShell payload. This is kind of how that's set up. Uh, but one of the better things that, to note about PowerShell is they recently added uh, PowerShell extension. So you can actually have a fully native PowerShell um, shell inside of your interpreter session. Before you could run PowerShell command, but it wouldn't let you do anything after that. It wouldn't give back feedback. Now you got just like you have PowerShell at your fingertips through interpreter. Uh, so here's an example of me loading PowerShell. Then I imported my own tool. Again, I had a interpreter access. I downloaded PowerView script. Um, and then I ran a command and it told me again where the domain was. Um, they've also exposed some of the, the interpreter functionality as .NET namespaces so you can interact with it. That's kind of what's going on here. I basically use, this is a .NET namespace. To, I use that to run uh, Mimikatz through interpreter. Um, but one of the more popular things is called web delivery. Again, Andrew Smith, who's across the way, he wrote, he was a co-author on this particular power, uh, particular Metasploit module. You basically go and you set up a Metasploit and then you get this command back up here. It's PowerShell, the NOP stands for no profile, the dash W is hidden, hide the window so nobody sees it, and then the dash C is run this command. 
So what I do is I connect to a computer and I just run this command and it gives me back my interpreter shell right back on the computer. Again, it uses the IEX download cradle to make a connection back to Metasploit and get that interpreter running in memory on the other box. I don't really have a demo, I was just kidding. Uh, Empire, again, it's written by that guy that I was talking about, Will Schroeder, and a couple other people. Um, but what's unique about uh, Empire is that it is a PowerShell only agent that stays in memory. So again, it all runs in PowerShell. It's like Meterpreter, it has the, like Meterpreter type functionality, but it runs all in PowerShell, all in memory on the target computer. Does it stay in memory after reboot? No, you, ha you have to set up persistence for that. If, it, if you hibernate, will it stay? Will it, will it come back? You can configure, just like with Metasploit, the timeout for the connection. So you can say, hey, if you can't reach the server for six weeks, then you can die, or you can set it for two days. You can set it for whatever you want to, but you can keep trying for as long as it wants. But if you reboot the computer, you'll lose, because it's in memory, you'll lose it. Some of the, the ways to use Empire. Uh, Power Empire is a PowerShell interface that connects to the Empire server. Again, I'm talking about PowerShell tools. Uh, Empire has a REST API. These are some of the functions that it has. This is an example of me connecting back to my PowerShell, uh, sorry, my Empire server, getting back information about the agents I have. Another web interface is called PowerShell Empire Web. This one's actually written in PHP. It's not a, power, it's not a PowerShell implementation. All right, talking some malware. How many of you guys went to Aaron Lancaster's talk earlier and heard about some ransomware? A couple of you. Well, PowerShell, they did the same thing that happens in PowerShell. Um, looks like I'm a little running with the hole on time, so I'll kind of give you the short and skinny on PowerShell. PowerShell malware comes uh, through mostly through infected Word documents that runs a visual basic code, uh, not visual, yeah, VBA code that will launch a PowerShell session, and guess what it uses? It uses the IEX download cradle when you have macros enabled on your Word documents to execute and do what it needs to do after that. This particular one used PowerShell, and then it would go infect all your other Word documents, so when you spread them around, it would just keep going. Uh, this one came through a malicious link as an attachment, but if you see down here, here's the code they were running. Again, they bypassed the execution <coughs> policy, and then they used the IEX download string to download their code right after that. Uh, PowerSniff is a different set of malware running through a campaign. Um, again, it downloads its shell code. Uh, you can actually download into memory DLL files as well and execute those on top of normal PowerShell stuff, but again, um, Right down here, it is using the IEX download cradle. Here's another set. This one kind of persisted in memory. Um, can't remember anything else unique about this one. But anyways, PowerShell, it does, the PowerShell malware does the same thing. It's just a different way to execute code on the box. It typically comes in an infected Word document. One thing to note, this one actually came with uh, infected PDF documents as well. There's a way that you can run code on a Windows box through a function in PDF, so it's not just limited to Windows docs. Uh, this one is actually ransomware. It uses PowerShell again with the IEX download cradle, uh, but this time the PowerShell actually does the encrypting of the files itself, so it doesn't use some other functionality. Again, what's unique about it, forensically, there's nothing on disk for you to go back and look at to see what happened. Uh, it'll just sit there and start locking up your files for you, encrypting you, and then throw up this message saying it wants money. Uh, Kanza is an uh, incident response framework. I know you see a bunch of stuff on the side of the screen. It probably doesn't mean nothing. Uh, what it pretty much does is it will remotely connect to any computer, and it will grab all of the files you would normally grab as an incident response person, and it will pull it back for you. And you can kind of configure that if you have a certain way that you grab files when you do forensics discovery or forensics response. And that's what, kind of what's going on here. It's grabbing a bunch of logs, a bunch of configuration settings, auto runs, all that kind of stuff. It grabs all the data. It sticks them into objects. Again, you can do powerful things with, with data objects, and you can go operate on them to do other things after that. Power Forensics is yet another tool. Um, he can grab some stuff about the boot record with his or the NTFS file system. He has a lot of neat stuff on here, but the, I like the bottom one on the right-hand corner, uh, Invoke Forensics DD. Pretty sure it just makes like a DD image of a hard drive across the network. PowerShell Arsenal is for reverse engineering. Again, another tool set. It has a bunch of functionality in it that you can use. Again, the tools are in PowerShell. You can use it to do reverse engineering with that. All right, a little bit of defense here. I told you a lot about a lot of ways to get owned and a lot of ways to have fun, but 
Uh, one of the ways you can work with uh, PowerShell to kind of stop attacks is to up your logging. I recommend everybody upgrade any computer they have to PowerShell version 5. Um, again, Windows 10 and comes with it by default, but you can upgrade Windows 7 up to PowerShell version 5 as well. And the reason for that is because it has uh, extended PowerShell logging in it. Before, you would just see that someone ran PowerShell, but if I used the encoded command, you wouldn't know what I ran. Uh, PowerShell version 5 has the ability to do script block logging, so that long string of code that I showed you was all base64 stuff. It'll actually show you the deobfuscated code in the log system, so if you pipe those logs to something uh, like Splunk and then you can turn around, you can actually see what's going on now. You can see the code that's being executed on a computer. So if somebody on your network used the IEX download string uh, download Cradle and downloaded their malware and you're checking your logs, you can see that they actually did that. Um, and it also has system-wide transcription, so like you can record on every computer on your entire domain or just specific ones of high value. Every PowerShell command that's entered from the terminal will save it into a logging file, just kind of like Linux shell logging. Uh, this is an example of me, again, creating some encoded command. Uh, this is what it looked like. Again, it's just a bunch of base64 string. All that was to set up this. Uh, when I executed the command on the system, when I executed it with the base64 encoded string, this is what gets stored in the log. You can actually see down here, it's the, it's the actual clear text of the string. It's not that long base64 encoded string that you didn't know what I was talking about. So you can, you can do base64 can, you can XOR it, you can ROT13, and you can compress it on top of that. But when it goes to the log file, it um, DFU skates it. Uh, PowerShell has this thing called constrained language mode, and it's probably the most powerful way to stop people from using PowerShell in nefarious ways. Uh, there's many, many language modes, but the one I want to talk to you about today is called constrained language mode. Again, I told you before that PowerShell is primarily interacting with .NET. When you configure your PowerShell to operate in constrained language mode, you can no longer interact with the .NET service anymore. <laughs> You're also not allowed to interact with Win32 APIs, and you can't interact with COM objects anymore. So pretty much neuters PowerShell. You can't do much of anything with it. Um, now, you can set it through an environment variable, which I show here, or you could push it out with the GPO, but if you have local admin on the box, you can just turn around and reset it back. But if it's a normal user and they don't have admin rights and you didn't give them local admin, please don't do that. Please don't give people local admin. Um, then they'll be stuck with that environment variable and they won't be allowed, their PowerShell will be stuck in constrained language mode. But if you have AppLocker deployed on your network, AppLocker can, when configured in allow mode, so whitelist mode, um, it will treat all PowerShell script as constrained language mode. And, and even if somebody is a local admin, they can't, set, they can't change that. They'll have to get control of AppLocker first. So if, if in tandem with AppLocker and you have constrained language mode set uh, because you're using allow only mode, then attackers will have a hard time executing code on your box. Here's an example of that. I did a check. This top one is me checking my language mode. It said I had full language mode. And then below it, I set the environment variable so that way I'd be put in constrained language mode. I had to open up a new window because it was a new environment. And then I checked my um, language mode again. You see here it says I'm in constrained language mode. And then I tried to use that beautiful IEX download cradle I talked about, and it didn't work. It wouldn't do anything because, because the PowerShell uh, language was constrained. So as long as you do that, you don't need to kill IEX in some other way? Like Go find IEX.exe and take it off the box or something. Now, IEX is just shorthand for invoke expression. Uh, so it'd be a, it's just another command line PowerShell, right? Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just, it's just running a different PowerShell command line. I don't personally know how IEX works in the background, but I'm willing to bet that it interacts with .NET and that functionality is removed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's additional resources. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but WMI is kind of like becoming a really popular thing. And what's neat about WMI is you can use it to execute PowerShell code as well. One of the malwares I didn't stop and talk about would actually execute its PowerShell code through WMI. These are some tools and some reports on WMI tools that you can use, but I didn't talk about it in this presentation. All right, that's it. <laughs> You guys have any questions? I know it was really, it was just meant to scratch the surface and just get you in touch with some of the PowerShell attack tools and defense tools and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Yeah, it was constrained language, PowerShell file only. Um, I think you can set the language mode all the way back as far as three, but I know you at least need version 4.5 or five to work with uh, AppLocker. And if I'm not 100% sure on that, I can point you in the right place where I know you can get the answer for sure. I've not personally deployed AppLocker or deployed 
um, constrained language mode on network. Like Matt was saying earlier, I get the beauty of breaking people's stuff and telling them to fix it. I don't actually have to fix anything. So blue team stuff is kind of, I see, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't actually, I've never had to implement it. You know, you got that thing of how technology is supposed to work, and then you try and roll it out, and it was really pain in the butt, and you would have never thought it would be that way. So, in theory, that's all you got to do. I've not actually set it up. Any other questions? So, in the wild, this is working really well for you, it sounds like. The IEX Download Cradle? Well, not just that, but the whole PowerShell. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. In fact, uh, I just did a pretext engagement uh, a week ago where I called somebody on the phone, and I told them I needed them to download this web form for me. I didn't know what to go, I didn't know what goes in this block eight, I told him. So he downloads it and his company had macros enabled on Word documents, so as soon as he opened the Word doc, I had an Empire shell back because I used PowerShell and the IX download cradle and I got myself an Empire agent on his computer right off the bat. Just infect the Word document just like the malware does. Okay, and I used the IX download cradle to pull my myself an Empire shell uh, onto the computer. Any other questions? No, thanks for your time, appreciate it.